And that's a great thing. And uh, because he's holy, we can aspire to be holy. But because he's holy, it means he's righteous and he's just, and we're grateful. I want to just uh, real quickly, but um, uh, intentionally say a big thank you to Brother James for all of his coordination and his effort last week. He put together all that we did at the street fair. And so we want to say thank you, Brother James. Give him a big hand. He did a good job. I know. So, and it's great. So that's a good thing. And uh, I'm on. Uh, okay. How about now? Okay. So thank you, Brother James. So teens, you are dismissed. Brother James is going to be teaching our teen class next door. So if you're a teenager, not if you want to be, but if you are a teenager, you can go next door and uh, you can uh, be a part uh, of that class. I'm thankful for our children's workers downstairs. Uh, we had a great night last night. At, uh, I was told at the Hispanic uh, uh, Day celebration. Had a big crowd, full crowd here last night. I know some of you attended. I'm sorry I missed it. I was speaking at a funeral, um, but uh, I heard it went well, and Pastor Santos, and so um, I'm just very thankful uh, for these uh, opportunities, and I hope that you'll make plans for the street, uh, for the fall festival in a couple of weeks, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, just some outreach. Let me give you some good news. How many of you want some good news today? Yeah. Man? All right. Are you ready? Yeah. It is only 74 days till Christmas. Whoa. Amen? Woo! That's a great news. Isn't that great? So that gives you time. I know some of you are panicking already. Amazon, where's my Amazon app? I need to get this ready to go. 74 days till Christmas. It's hard to believe that, and, uh, but it, it'll be here soon. And uh, holidays are always a fun time, and they're definitely a fun time here at the church. And uh, I hope that you'll be here. And I just want to echo what's been said. If you're visiting, thank you for being here. We never take for granted when people visit. We actually had three or four first-time visitors in the early service. So you know that those are folks that are uh, intentional about coming. And uh, we're really glad that you're here today. Please stop at the Welcome Center. If we haven't met, I'd love the opportunity to get to meet you. And uh, if we can be of help to you, if you're praying about a church, I uh, hope that you'll pray about all nations. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer out here this morning. I'm going to be preaching on a subject you don't hear me preaching about often, um, but uh, we're going to talk about politics today. <laughs> and you say, wait a minute, stop that, Pastor. You're not supposed to do that. Separation of church and state. Let me, let me, let me uh, just say a word about that, if I can. Uh, and this is a really good history lesson, um, if you've never have done this. Um, you know, the separation of church and state is 99% uh, used out of context and uh, used for the exact opposite of the reason for which uh, it was um, um, introduced. In uh, 1802, the Danbury Baptist Association, a group of, of pastors in New England, Baptist pastors all up here in the Northeast, wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson, who was then the current president, and essentially, and I'm using uh, 2024 words, okay, but essentially they said, hey, Mr. President, we are really, really concerned that the government is going to start intruding into church life, that the government is going to start uh, uh, intimidating and mandating and influencing our worship of God. And that is why so many left Europe and came to the new world so that we could worship God freely. And so what's very interesting, if you read uh, our third president, Thomas Jefferson's response to them, it was fantastic. And essentially he said, gentlemen, pastors, ministers, I agree wholeheartedly. And we understand there's a supreme being and the last thing that we need to do and the last thing that I will ever attempt to do is to allow government to intrude into man's worship of God and into church life. And uh, so the Establishment Clause, the Free Exercise Clause were introduced, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. But that, you know, when you always hear church and state and they say, oh, well, that is, yep, you better not get this church stuff out of the state, get this church stuff out of the business, get this church stuff out of the classroom, get this church stuff out of government. And that's the exact opposite 
of what was supposed to happen. It was, hey, please don't bring in politics and government issues into what we're doing to worship the Lord. Don't pretend like you have a more supreme position than Almighty God. And so that's good to know that. Having said that, um, we are in an election year. If you didn't know that, I I don't know if that's possible. And uh, we are only 24 days away from an election. Now, uh, let me just say a couple of things. And if you're visiting, you may think, oh, wow, uh, uh, listen, and and, uh, it's a little bit unusual. But uh, you need to understand a couple of things. One, as the pastor here, I... Um, am responsible before God to speak uh, truth about all issues. And like it or not, um, what's going on in our government and in the political world affects our lives. And here's the truth. God has much to say about government and politics. Did you know that? Now, you and I would be very foolish in other places and parts of our life to exclude God. None of us would say, hey, I'm in this dating relationship and I'm a Christian, but you know what? The Bible has no place here in this dating relationship, so don't be talking to me about what God wants in my dating relationship. We wouldn't do that. And neither should we have that same attitude when it comes to what's happening in politics and in the government. God has much to say about it. We're going to look here in Mark chapter 12 in just a moment. If you want to turn there, we'll be there in just a moment. Let me just say a couple of of other things just quickly. One, it is not my intention today to get you to vote a certain way. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. If you want to ask me who I'm voting for privately, I'm happy to tell you, and I'm happy to tell you why. Uh, But I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. Um, I'm I'm not here to persuade you to become Democrat or Republican. Um, But I am here to do a couple of things. One, I do want to encourage you to vote. Okay, our church is not anti-government. I want to encourage you to do your homework and to research all the issues, all the proposals, and all those who are running for elected office. But ultimately, I want to inform you today on God's perspective as it pertains to government. And I hope that then, therefore, you and I will at least understand, will definitely be responsible to then hopefully vote God's values. You and I should never vote a color, red or blue or green or whatever. We should never vote a strict party line. Should never vote a personality. I like him, I like her. You should never vote for someone because of how popular they may or may not be. You should never vote Uh, on someone uh, just because uh, you sense or feel that uh, that they might be a good person, you, you, you and I have the responsibility to pray for all, but to vote for those who are seeking to uphold uh, God's values. And so I hope today that can maybe shed a little bit of light on that. For some of you, you, you may be upset, and I hope you know I love you, and so um, it's, I'm accountable to the Lord, so you won't hear me go on for weeks and weeks about this. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons today um, that, that I'm preaching today is because you still have time to register to vote. If you're 18 years of age and older, and you're a citizen of the United States, you have till October 26 to register to vote, and I would encourage you to do that, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why that's important. Uh, you still have time to do that. So that's why we're speaking on this today. Next week, we've got a guest speaker, and then we're going to start a new study on Psalm 23, and it'll be great, and we're looking forward to that. So I hope that you'll hear me today. And then if you're like me, you get questions from a lot of people, family members, coworkers, right? And uh, even amongst Christians. And I get it, you know, don't, don't mix church and politics. Well, I, I want you to see how Jesus handled that. Mark chapter 12. Now, um, Jesus was not always liked by the the religious leaders of the day. As a matter of fact, when you get to Mark chapter 12, you find that the religious leaders were coming at him, coming at him, coming at him, trying to throw him off his game, trying to make him look like a fool, and repeatedly they failed. 
So now we get to verse 13, and notice it says, and they, these are the religious leaders, send unto Jesus certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians for the purpose of seeking to catch Jesus in his words. Now, here's what you need to know. The Pharisees were on one end of the spectrum. The religious leaders, religious, the Pharisees were like ultra. As a matter of fact, some would call them legalists when it came to the Old Testament law. They didn't even agree with the Jewish leaders. They were on the polar opposite of the Herodians. The Herodians were Jewish people. They weren't really religious. As a matter of fact, they had kind of cozied up to Rome, and they were okay with the current government. And so these two were on polar opposites. They would fight with each other. But what is interesting is the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, were able to convince people from both groups to come together for one purpose, to destroy Jesus. Think about that. They found a common enemy in Jesus. Now, how many of us understand this truth? The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. Amen? A few weeks ago, we studied the scriptures. We were reminded of that, that the blessed hope is Jesus. It's not a politician. It's not a government. It's not a nation. It's not any amount of money. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. And Satan hates anything connected to Jesus Christ. And so he works through every open door and avenue that he can, and that is even at times what's going on in the government sector of the world. And it's interesting to me that, it, that, that men from both groups had this one common denominator, let's destroy Jesus. When you read in the book of Revelation, if you know prophecy, the day's coming when the whole world government will turn against Jesus. So what does Jesus do when they come to him? Verse 14. They come, and what do they say? Master, we know that thou art true, and that you care for no man. I mean, you're not a respecter of person. You speak truth, and you regard not the person of men, but you teach the way of God in truth. Well, they should have just stopped. If that was a true saying, then their whole lives would be changed. So they're mocking him a little bit, flattering him a little bit, or so they think. So Jesus, we we just have one question, and it pertains to government, it pertains to politics. Is it lawful to give tribute or pay taxes to Caesar, or is it not? Are we supposed to be engaged in our local government? Are we supposed to care about what's happening politically, or are we not? Now, you can imagine if Jesus says, absolutely not, then you got a whole bunch of anarchists, and they can run off to Rome and say, this Jesus guy's a zealot, he's against the government. Or if he said, well, yeah, you know, government's everything, government is the way to go, and you'll find hope and strength in your government, then there would be the one group that says, but yeah, but this Roman government, I mean, you know what Rome is doing? Rome is butchering people, and and they're killing kids, and they're just crucifying people, they're bloodthirsty and you you're a proponent of that and how can God honor that but notice what Jesus says he says in verse 15 oh in verse 15 they continue shall we give or shall we not give but he knowing their hypocrisy said unto them remember God always looks on the heart why tempt you me why are you testing me bring me a penny that I may see it So they brought it, and he holds it up, and he saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? Whose picture's on the penny, and whose name's on the penny? And they said, well, Caesar's. And Jesus says, well, then give Caesar that which is Caesar's, but give to God that which is God's. And they had nothing to say. Now, you notice that Jesus here speaks And when he speaks, he indicates that there is a legitimate role for government. He's not an anarchist. He's not telling people to overthrow. 
He says, give to government that which is theirs. They have a place to fulfill. But he also reminds us that there is a limited role of government. Look, the government may own this penny, but the government doesn't own you. I own you, Jesus said. And today it would do us all well to remember we belong to God. Amen? If you're a believer you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are a child of God. Now, maybe you're here today and you say, well, what do you mean, a follower of Christ or believer? There's no way we could get to heaven. Our sin separated us. We're full of shame, right? We're full of fear. We're, 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 we're guilty before a holy God. But Jesus comes so that he can pay our penalty, make us innocent, so he can bring honor back into our life. He reveals his power by dying and being buried and rising again. He brings salvation to us for all who will believe. If you've never made that decision today, you can call out and say, Jesus, nobody did for me what you did. I put my trust in you. The government is not your savior. Jesus Christ is. Okay? If you're living and hoping and, and banking everything on this election, you're going to be disappointed. Jesus never brings disappointment. He's the hope of the world. And, and Jesus got a plan. He's got a purpose. And it's going to roll right on. Having said that, Jesus does not dismiss the role of government in our life. And if you are a follower of Christ, you and I need to understand God's perspective of government. And then knowing that, we will be able to live in such a way that not only reflects Jesus Christ, but it reflects in such a way in which we are the citizens that we need to be. And what's sad is that sometimes we get all upset. We get upset at people who know not God, people who don't have a relationship with Jesus, and we get upset that maybe they vote a certain way or they allow things to happen, and it's contrary to maybe what God would want. But they don't know. The Bible says that the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. But what is more tragic, I think, is when Christians, people who know Jesus of the Bible, people who have put their trust in him, when they haven't taken time to know, now what does God say about my marriage? What does God say about my kids? What does God say about my job? What does God say about the government? When they haven't taken the time to read it, to study it, to learn it, and then apply it to their life, that's a very tragic, tragic reality. As a matter of fact, I got an article somebody sent me this week where they, they estimate that 104 million uh, uh, people of faith, 104 million people of faith say they're not even gonna vote in this election. And that's an issue. We'll talk about that in a moment. Why wouldn't you wanna represent God? Why wouldn't you want to at least be the voice that seeks to have a word to help try to promote some things that God values most? Here's the reality. In, in, in Psalm 33, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And you and I would do well to remember that. You know, no country has been blessed as quickly as the United States of America. And you say, why is that? Because we're all perfect? Uh, hardly. But you cannot discount the fact that even the origin of this country and how things came about, there was a divine hand involved in it. And in all the original documents, like it or not like it, but if you pour over them and you read them, you see the heavy influence of Judeo-Christian values and morality, which really results in the fact that this country, like it or not for some, is thoroughly Christian at its roots. And the result of that is just what God said. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Having said that, it's imperative for us to understand God's perspective when it comes to this thing called government. John Adams, our second president, he was the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He said this, we have no government armed with power 
capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. He said, we have no government that can withstand mankind unless God is involved. That a government, a nation left to figure things out for itself apart from God, it has no hope. He would say avarice or greed, ambition, revenge, gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Was he saying that if God is removed from this thing we call government, this thing we call politics or the interacting of government issues, if God's removed, we're in bad shape. You hear people talk about the Constitution. Why is the Constitution so important? The Constitution was one of the founding documents. It's that which, upon which our, our nation is structured. And it's that governing document. And because it was uh, written and, and it was produced by men who uh, understood and, and approved by the, the nation, uh, people who at least had a fear of God and understood what morality was, you see peppered all throughout it principles that come from the word of God. And so as a nation, you, 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 people talk about, well, I'm just a constitutionalist. Get this God thing out of there. Well, here, here's the thing. When you read the Constitution, you realize that it's got God's influence all over it. As a matter of fact, there's no uh, other document that's been more reproduced around the world than the United States structure of government, which we'll talk about in a minute. Constitution's often borrowed as a template and the reason that we've been blessed as we follow these things because there's moral principles, biblical principles underneath. So as you think about people for whom you're voting or you're listening to people and they want to shred and they want to rip up some of these founding documents which you know as a believer because you have spiritual insight as you read the Bible, you see that a lot of these statements have been influenced and undergirded by biblical principles, and you see people want to shred it apart, that should make you realize that's not going to help us. We need to stick with that which God condones and that which God values. Again, some of you will be a little upset that I'm even speaking about this subject today, and please forgive me. What's my responsibility? Some of you will be upset that I don't take it much further. You notice I wore an orange tie today, not a red, not a blue, right? Okay. <clears throat> we are one nation under God. Yeah, go Mets. That's exactly right. Yeah, let's go Mets. There we go. But I am a Yankee fan too, so I... I, I, I that's it. I where the country doesn't divide us, our baseball teams divide us, amen? So, <laughs> All right, let me give you a couple of, of things today, all right, because it's important. You know, here's the reality. If you're a child of God, you are one of God's sheep, which means we have a shepherd, amen? And that shepherd's job is to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, John 10, 28. My sheep hear my voice, right? And I know them, and they follow me. He says, they belong to me. And so we do well to listen to our shepherd. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, once pointed out, we should not so much ask whether the Lord is on our side, but rather if we are on the Lord's side. Amen. We as Christians do not live in a vacuum. We are here today as a result of where we were yesterday. And we will be where we will be tomorrow as is being determined by where we are today. Choices we make, things we value, decisions that we come to all have a future bearing. November 5th, if you're a citizen, you have an opportunity to vote. You have an opportunity to vote for the 47th president, vice president of the United States. You have the opportunity to vote for other positions. You have the opportunity to vote for proposals and bills. You and I need to understand our responsibility to understand 
what God desired and designed government to be. And then when we go to vote and when we go to pray, we're able to do so in a more intelligent manner and in a way that honors and glorifies God. So we must understand government and God's uh, perspective and our responsibility. And let's turn to Romans chapter 13. Can we do that today? Romans chapter 13, we're going to look at some scriptures. And um, by no means we're going to solve every political issue today, and that's really not the intention. But I hope that at least there'll be some understanding of some things. Now, remember, when Paul writes this book, he's writing this letter to Christians living in Rome. If you know your history, Christians were not well liked by the Roman government. As a matter of fact, Paul is writing to Christians during the reign of Nero. Nero is one of the most ruthless Caesars to ever live. Nero was the one that really was known and lauded for the Colosseum practices and Christians being thrown to the lions and, and the gladiator games. He was also the one, by his own history, he murdered several of his wives because he didn't like them, and he murdered an, uh, another woman's husband so he could marry her until she, he murdered her, and then he murdered his own mother. He was the one that, in a fit of rage and insanity, nearly burned half of Rome to the ground. But to cover, he blamed the Christians. It was their fault. He strung them up and lit them as human torches to light the city of Rome. So it's during this time that Paul writes this letter, and notice what he writes in verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now notice, there is no power but of whom? But of God. And the powers that be are ordained or appointed by God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You need to understand, I need to understand, God is not anti-government. Again, demonstrated by Jesus. As a matter of fact, government was one of those institutions that was created by God. God creates uh, this institution known as marriage. And God says, hey, one man, one woman, four life, kids, and he has the structure down. He creates this amazing uh, 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 union we call marriage. God creates another institution we call the church. It's conceived by Jesus in Matthew 16, and it's given birth in Acts chapter 2. And it's a place where those who know him, who have put their trust in him, can be called out and meet together and worship God together and learn his truth and pray for one another. He, he, he describes and designs this thing called the church. And then he structures this institution called government. God is not an anarchist. You say, what do I need to know about government? All government power let's be honest, is appointed by God. Meaning that there's not one politician that can do one thing if God says no. Remember when Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do? And Jesus said, you can't do anything unless my father allows you to do it. Now, why doesn't God intervene? The time will come when he does. But he gives man free will. And by the way, he gives us free will and he tells us we will reap what we have sown. That's just how it rolls. Now, God's plan will keep moving on. Nobody's going to stop that. But our responsibility and the decisions we make every day for which we're going to be accountable, they're important to God. But we need to understand government officials are to lead in conjunction with God. You say, why? Why is that true? Because here's the reality. Mankind is sinful. Why does God even set up this institution called government? Because mankind, you and I, we can't figure out how to do things the right way. Jeremiah would say in Jeremiah 10, 23, oh Lord, I know that the way of man, it's not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man cannot figure out how to put things together and how to make everybody get along and how to make everything work. And why? Because we're sinners. 
We're sinners. And so because God loves us, he puts some structure into place. If you're a parent and you love your children, you put structure into place. You don't tell little junior, do whatever you want, whenever you want, stay up all night, I eat whatever you want, you can go to school if you want, you don't have to go to school, I don't care, and I'm the best parent ever. (laughs) At some point, when everybody finds out, they're going to declare, you're the worst parent ever. We need structure in our life. So God, who's the only qualified one, says, let me come in and help you. Government is only as good as the people running the government. By the way, that's why our ultimate hope is not in government. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But what does the Bible say in Proverbs 29 and verse 2? This is the reality. When the righteous are in authority, what happens? The people rejoice. But the reality is when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. So here's here's something to consider when you go to vote, when you're listening to people that are trying to get your vote, am I rejoicing or am I mourning? Is God rejoicing? Is God mourning? But that's the reality. What happens at the top affects us all. And so God says, let it be known that I am the ultimate authority. Do you believe that today? That God is the ultimate authority. Not someone holding an office in Washington, D.C., not a senator somewhere, not a Supreme Court. God is the ultimate authority. And when we forget that, things fall apart. You see that everywhere across the world. You can look at governments that have turned into dictatorships and regimes where tribes are fighting against tribes and people are having power struggles and there is famine and there is a disease. People aren't getting the things that they need because people are in charge. Notice because of man's sin, there are big consequences. And when man thinks that he can s- sidestep God's authority, it's always going to be disastrous. Is that something new? Not at all. Genesis 6, where the Bible uses the words that mankind did extreme wickedness and they did what only their imagination could could, could conceive. Whatever came to their mind, they did it. If I can think it, I can do it. And God said, enough. And he sent a worldwide flood and destroyed them all and started over again with Noah and his family. Well, surely, man, we got into shape. You get into Genesis chapter 11, and what do you see? You see it again. You see that the unity of people, the world as as they knew it then, all got together. Maybe that first federation of nations. They all got together and decided they're going to build a tower, and they can really do whatever they want to do. They don't need God anymore. They can dismiss him from their life, and what does God do? He destroys it. He disperses them. See, even though a society tries to exclude God, God refuses to be removed from the affairs of men. And we should thank him for that. But when we get haughty and arrogant and hey, we get to make the rules and we get to do what we want to do, it's going to be disastrous. So as you think about mayors and governors and judges and presidents, as you think about these people who are going to be in position, hey, we need to pray, we need to do our research, we need to evaluate, are they men and women either intentionally or unintentionally who know, hey, God is the ultimate authority. And it's not up to me to decide this is what I want to do and this is what I think should be done and this is what everybody around me wants to do. And there are those groups of people and there are those parties that push that kind of agenda, that move away from the things that God says are right and wrong and want to rewrite some things. History is replete with examples. He is the only one that is to be revered as the ultimate authority. So... If we understand that God's the ultimate authority for government, then government works well. If the people in office understand that. Again, when I was voted in to be the pastor here in 2002, 
I needed to have an understanding of what was expected of me. Some of you were here back in that day. We're all a lot younger then. (laughs) But it wasn't that, hey, I can come in and now preach whatever I want and say whatever I want, and what are you going to do about it? I understood that this church was built on a history, and our former pastor and pastors, we merged with, with another church, Pastor McArdle, Pastor Nilsson, and the good people who planted these churches and, and funded these churches. They loved God. They had a, a belief, a doctrinal statement that was according to the Bible. And who am I to come in and say, eh, let's throw that all out and let's start teaching and preaching something else? As a matter of fact, if I started doing that, I can guarantee you out I would have gone. So what is the responsibility of those who are governing? All right, so God's not anti-government. He's the authority, but he's looking for a governing body that will uphold what he values. All government is appointed by him. So government officials are to lead in conjunction with God. That means they're to follow God's design. God's uh, plan, God's values. You know, the American Revolution here in the 1700s was different than revolutions in other countries because it was started here with the understanding that all men are evil. And as citizens, we need to be protected from those who run the government. That just because people are in leadership doesn't mean they're perfect. And can I just say this, and I'll get to it in a minute. If you're waiting for the perfect person who looks like God and is a hundred percent like God you're you're wasting your time it's not going to happen and can I also say to you when we talk about voting and political things you're not voting for a Sunday school teacher you're not voting for a pastor But you are voting for someone who understands the history of this country and at least has a knowledge that, hey, God's in charge and that we're nothing if if, if not for God. We're only blessed because of God. And I'm not here to change that. I'm just going to be here to try to advocate and encourage the things that God encourages. Are they going to be perfect? Not at all. But neither are you. Neither am I. When the Worshippers of God left Europe. They came because there were tyrannical uh, people in Europe who were telling them what they could do and couldn't do with their faith. We're telling them how they could worship. We're telling them essentially what was right and wrong rather than allowing them to listen to God and, and hearing his explanation of what is right and what is wrong. And so when they came in in this country, charters and documents were prepared, and and, and this country was founded upon principles rooted in Scripture. The government has a proper role. Its citizens also have a proper role. And it was set up so that it could be practiced for generations to come. Checks and balances. There are branches of government to hold each one accountable They had left Europe where there was dictators and regimes. We don't want that. We want checks and balances. On the federal uh, level, you've got the executive, the presidency. You've got the legislative where Congress is. You've got the judicial where the Supreme Court is. And you break that down in the state and even in the local uh, level. Why? So there could be some checks and balances. There are some that want to come and just do away with all of that. And just let us tell you what you need to do. Can I, can I say this to you very respectfully? Let God tell us what to do. Because any other person that I listen to or you listen to, including myself, we're not perfect. But he is. Our country was founded as a republic, not a democracy. Say, what in the world is that? Democracy, it allows all people to have power in their hands directly. Oh, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go affect this change. But 
a, a republic is where the mass majority as one voice elect officials to perform the people's function and to enact and administer government over a large region. I can't go to California and do things myself and get it all fixed. I can't go down to Florida and do that. And so they set it up so it would be a republic. There's a reason why when we uh, state and declare the, the, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance that we recite to this republic for which we stand, one nation under God. We're democratic, meaning that, hey, it's, it's of the people, by the people, for the people. Everybody's important. Everybody has a part. Everybody has a voice, which is why you should vote if you're a citizen and live here. But you get to vote to put the right people in place to uphold that which you believe is important, which as a Christian should be, what does God say is important? We're a democratic republic set up under God. We need to understand that God's in charge. When government officials don't, there's a problem. What is it that God wants these government officials to do? Uh, last week, we had a pastor from Utah, and he's running for a state school board in the state of Utah. He wasn't looking to do that. He's a big guy. He weight lifts. He's a chaplain for Salt Lake City Police Department. He, he's got a position at the Air Force Base there. He's been a youth pastor for 25 years. And high-ranking government officials called him and said, look, you've been in more public schools. You work with more teenagers who are dysfunctional and who don't have family support. We need a good voice who can bring in Christian values and, and, and do something to help our education system. And he said, okay. And he won the primary ousted the incumbent, been there for years and years and years and years and years. It's okay. You find a lot of Christians, especially in the early days of our country, who were bankers and doctors and farmers and lawyers, said, what, I'll go take a turn? Sure, I'll go down and I'll serve two years to help make good decisions for our country, but that wasn't gonna be my career, which you see today. And so if you're getting paid to legislate, then you're gonna often allow your influence to go where the money is and that's that so what are these government officials to do let's look in Romans 13 verse 3 for rulers now notice this they're not a terror verse 3 to good works but to the evil will thou not then be afraid of the power do that which is good and you shall have praise of the same for he who is governing is the minister of God to thee for good. You remember the time when, when you did right, you didn't have to worry about law enforcement? There are some places today that's not the case, that if I step in and do something right, I might get in trouble. If I step up and say something, oh, well, I don't, and so people don't do anything. It, it shouldn't be that way. He would go on to say, look, for he bears not the sword in vain. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And by the way, can I just say this really big picture? If we as people, as a nation, don't uphold right and punish evil, then God will come in and do it. But the reason he set up some structure is to protect people that are seeking to do right. That are trying to do what would honor God. We know we're not, we're not perfect. I admitted to the first service today, look, I'm gonna tell you something right now. I've been pulled over by police officers and I've been given speeding tickets before. Right, confession is good for the soul. Okay, how dare they do that? Don't they know you're a minister? I tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen to me. Guess what? I was guilty. And can I tell you, it's been a long time since I've gotten a ticket. Because I don't like paying money to other people when I don't have to. So may I suggest to you that I learned from my consequences, from my punishment. How many of you have learned things from your consequences and your punishment? What happens, though, if there's no consequences? What happens if there's no punishment? It just grows and grows and grows, and those who are seeking to do right live in fear, but most of all, God is not pleased. God said, now look, 
man, I love you, but you don't know what you're doing. So I'm gonna set up a structure. You need to understand, I'm the ultimate authority. So don't go in there thinking you can make up rules and well, I think this is right. And, mm, this is right. This is okay to marry these people. And uh, you know, uh, we can kill anybody we want to kill. That's not your place. You need to follow my right and my wrong. And so those who come into office need to understand that's their priority to protect against lawlessness. You say, what's lawlessness? There are four words used in the New Testament, and they range from reveling in the street, hating different classes of people, just abandoning everything that's decent, to just blatant contempt for the law. We're to guard against that. People should fear the law. They should know there's a right and wrong and that there are consequences. And that is what our government leaders are supposed to uphold according to God. When you go to vote, don't vote because somebody promised you a lot of money. That is not the requirement that God gave to those who are in leadership positions. I mean, frankly, I've had people come to me and say, hey, you know, I'm going to vote for this candidate here in the city because this candidate came to my neighborhood and said he was going to build a basketball court right behind my house. I mean, is that the top priority? Matter of fact, two years later, I asked that person, did he ever build a basketball court? And he said, no. <laughs> That's not the priority. Uphold that which is right, and then to punish the guilty. We need to understand and frankly demand of our government officials that they uphold that which is important to God. What is important to God? Life. I get it. Honestly, I've got issues with both candidates for president when it comes to life. The one, I know President Trump, he's, he's kind of six weeks, maybe 15 weeks. And I don't like that. Life starts at fertilization, the Bible says. But you take the other side, and I'll just be blunt. Kamala Harris says, you can uh, abort whenever, wherever, as much as you want, even up to the point of birth. So I have issues with both of them. I do. And so we need to pray and we need to plead. So does that mean I don't vote? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we need to encourage our candidates to uphold that which is important to God. By the way, let me just say this too. When you vote, you're not voting for just one person. You're voting for hundreds of people. When you vote for a position like president, or when you vote for governor, when you vote for mayor, those men, those women are going to have influence in all the realms, and they're going to have opportunities to put judges in. Can I say to you, Roe v. Wade, when Roe v. Wade was over, well, first of all, when Roe v. Wade was introduced and approved in 1973, one of the most devastating and wicked laws ever passed where the federal government mandated that every state now had to allow abortion. And so what happened in the last couple of years when that was flipped, I believe Ryan mentioned it when he preached here a couple months ago. Praise God, the the first thing that happened is thousands and thousands of, of babies lived all across the United States. Because what happened is that Five or ten years ago, a lot of judges were put in the local level, the state level, and even in, in the Supreme Court, there were judges who were actually understanding of what our founding documents said. Now, as a Christian, we know that those documents were influenced by the Bible. But, okay, so they don't want to follow the Bible, but they're going to follow these documents. Well, what do these documents say? And as they looked at them, they realized what in the whole wide world is the federal government doing sticking their nose in and telling 50 states that they have to allow abortion in their state? 
That was never what the founders intended, and so they repealed it. So now, here's what that means. Are you ready? I know people say all the time, a woman has a right. She can do whatever she wants. Of course. A woman can take a gun on Jamaica Avenue and start shooting everybody she wants. But that doesn't mean it's right. You understand that? So what this repeal means is now if the state of Ohio decides we don't want to support abortion at all, and the people in that state, they say yes, with a majority vote, that's what we want, then they do not have to allow abortion to take place in their state. And if you live there and you don't like it, you can move to another state. There's 49 other states. Or if you, like New York, says, absolutely, we're going to abort any and every, whenever you want, and we're going to do it and go to hell in a handbasket, then so be it if that's what everybody wants. But at least it gives every state and every person in that state the opportunity to have a voice. And those things matter to God. Government official is to uphold what's important to God. Life Marriage, the sanctity of marriage, which is stripped and been ripped up and now it's two consenting adults. Soon maybe it's three or four. Maybe it's an old dude and a young kid or a woman and her dog. I don't know. They're moving it all over the place. And we laugh, but who would have thought 50 years ago that marriage could be two men in the history of mankind? That has never been said. And all of a sudden, we've evolved and have new enlightenment. Well, when we understand God makes the rules, we realize God hasn't changed. Do what you're going to do, but don't call it marriage. We're to uphold life and marriage. We're to protect Israel. That's in the Bible. We're to protect our people here in the United States from threats both foreign and domestic. I get it. Honestly, I am voted in as the pastor. I'm here. My job is to teach, to guide, to warn, and to protect. I mean, but hey, that's so harsh, pastor. You shouldn't tell anybody what they can and can't do. You should just let people do whatever they want to at the church. So next week, fine. It's okay if we have guys with sex offender backgrounds coming in and teaching our kids. That's fine. Oh, we don't want to be prejudiced or biased. It's okay if we let all kind of guys come in and just be all up in in all of our ladies' business. By the way, can I say this? We've had to deal with issues and escort people out. Why? Because we're bigots and racists and we hate people? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, we'll take them out on the sidewalk and open a Bible and try our best to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Because, hey, the government, that's not our hope. Jesus is. But by the same token, I stand before God for the flock that he has allowed me to shepherd You actually stand before God to kind of keep an eye on your brothers and sisters. So sometimes we have to escort some people out and say, you can't be conducting yourself in that manner. You can't be talking to people that way. You can't put the lives and the well-being of our children in jeopardy. Big shout out to our security guys. By the way, ladies, you need to know you got some brothers here that got your back, all right? So... You don't, maybe, you don't hear about issues, but a lot of issues are being taken care of, and if you live in the real world, you know there's a lot of stuff going on, but it doesn't have to happen here. But wouldn't you want me to do that? Shouldn't I do that? Well, that's the same illustration, that's the same really example and, 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 and uh, instruction that God gives to those who are governing. You need to protect those who are seeking to do right, and boy, you need to enforce judgment on those who are doing wrong. Those who are endorsing sin against God, those who would do our country harm. God gave those in leadership that authority to execute wrath upon them that do evil. But when people forget that God's the ultimate authority, 
it messes everything up. Your officials, my officials, should be an advocate of good works and should be a terror of those who are doing evil works. Boy, we need to pray for that. And then, let me leave you with this, the responsibility of the Christian. All right, so I understand authorities from God, he set this up. Now I understand government officials, they're supposed to protect those seeking to do right by God, and they're to punish those who aren't. That's their job. And when we say right and wrong, that is according to God's definition, not some they made up. So what's my responsibility? I need to go bury my head in the sand. I need to live a Pollyannish kind of life and think everything's great. Paul would write to these Roman believers in the oppressive uh, city of Rome. And he talked to them about their civic responsibilities. In chapter 12, we won't read it, but he would say, hey, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. As much as possible, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Your faith, your relationship with God is that which triumphs. Again, a Democratic president, a Republican president, a Democratic Congress, a Republican Congress, uh, getting 30 more Supreme Court justices, getting rid of who we have, upholding who we have, None of that is going to do for people what Jesus Christ will do. But what is my responsibility? Romans chapter 13, he would end the chapter in verse 14 by bringing it full circle and say, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Hey, so don't get all and political and so saturated that you forget, wait a minute, wait a minute, my allegiance is first and foremost to God. I have, government has a role, but it's got a limited role in my life. Jesus has my life. And I'm not going to forget that. Sometimes as Christians, we, we kind of get so immersed, and then we begin to uh, transfer all of our hopes onto a, a campaign or to an election result. Our hope is in Jesus. Amen. Having said that, we have great responsibility. What's my responsibility? Let me give you three. First, vote biblically. And I'm going to say that to you again. If you are a citizen, 18 years of age and older, you should vote. I don't want to vote. Who cares? No big deal. This article I read this week said millions of religious people, most of whom are Christian, will not vote in November's election. Out of these people, 51% of people of faith, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Mormons, said they would vote, only 51%. That means 104 million religious people said they will not vote. Think of that. It's almost a third of the United States population. And out of that 104 million, 83% of them are Christians. Now, think of it this way. Two thoughts, or three thoughts. One, you should vote because it's your voice. Men and women bled and died so that you might have the freedom to actually vote on who is governing over you. There are people all across this planet that would give anything to come to this country to have some freedoms, a freedom to at least speak and they can't. They have no choice on who's ruling them. So you and I, we have a, 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 an option, a great privilege. You may say, well, it's not going to matter anyway. Well, if every person thought that, then it's going to make a significant difference. People bled and died. If not for you, do it for them. Number two, if you don't vote and you can you are literally giving the governorship of this country over to other people who don't even know God. And they don't understand that God set it all up and why God set it all up. And you're going to say, you just go ahead and do it the best you can, already knowing what God said, that they're not going to be able to figure it out and only bring his judgment. Now, because we live in a republic 
It is the majority. So if you vote and I vote and everybody votes and, and the majority legally says, hey, we want to go a different direction and we want to do things that don't honor God, then so be that. God's still faithful and at least I can go to sleep at night knowing that I tried to at least promote that which brings God value and glory and at least try to promote some things that would get people to consider maybe something beyond themselves that ultimately honors God, why would I give away a voice to try to promote godliness? Why would I give that away willingly? As a matter of fact, I believe we have responsibility. Aren't we light in this world? So when I go to work, I'm supposed to show Jesus. When I... Hmm, turn on Netflix and I'm searching, I'm supposed to show Jesus. When I go to the bank, I'm supposed to reflect Jesus. And when I go and vote, I should reflect Jesus. Right? So go vote. We're to do all we can to at least put out there those things that, value, that are of value to God. Yes, there is no perfect candidate. Yes, I would want neither of the presidential candidates to be my pastor. <laughs> but we're not voting on a pastor. So God, as I go through and I do my research, research should be more than just, hey buddy, what do you think? Oh, okay. Well, I've always voted this color, so I'm just going to vote this color. That's not research. Do your research. We have resources. Glad to put them in your hands. Here's the good thing about these two candidates. They have both served. So you can go read their record. You can go back and read Kamala Harris's record in California. You can read her record as a senator in Washington, D.C., and you can read her record as a vice president of the United States the last four years. You can go back and read Donald Trump's record when he was president for four years. It's all public record. You can read it. And did it help promote things that God would promote or does it not? But don't give away a freedom that you have been given. Do your research. But make sure when you vote, you vote biblically. Because remember, when you vote, whoever gets in it's not just one person. There are hundreds that are going to take that same ideology and that same philosophy and they're going to enter into our schools and into places of, of power and leadership that's going to influence every aspect of life, including our children and our grandchildren's lives for years to come. Vote biblically. Don't vote race, color, party, personality. Ask, where does he or she stand in accordance to the Bible? Do your research. And then, is my faith in Jesus influencing my vote? And then, let me leave you this. Vote biblically. Number two, live biblically. So I've done my homework. I'm doing what I should do. I'm glad I live in a country where I still can cast a vote and that I can do research and that I, I'm, I'm going to do that and I'm going to pray about it. Now I understand how government's not there to just give me everything that I want. They're not my savior. Jesus is my savior. And they have specific requirements from God. They're supposed to protect those that are doing right and they're supposed to punish those that are doing evil. So if I have a voice, I'm going to try to to promote that. And then I'm going to keep living for God. Just keep living for God. Remember Jesus said, yeah, do what you got to do civically. Do what you got to do politically. Do it. But remember, you belong to the Lord. You go do that, but you keep representing me. Because here's the thing. doesn't matter who gets in office. Jesus is going to keep doing what he does. His plan will not be stopped. But I want to make sure that I'm doing my part. I can't stress that enough. If you find out you need surgery, 
I hope you don't do this. I hope you don't just walk up to the, to the desk at the administration there and say to the secretary, I'm supposed to have gallbladder surgery. Can you just find somebody? I don't care who it is. I'll just be sitting in there on that, on that gurney. Whoever it is, just have them do it. It'll all work out. But that's how we approach sometimes our government officials. God will do it. He'll just do it. Who cares? I'm not worried about it. Well, you have an opportunity and yea, a responsibility. And by the way, if you're waiting for a perfect surgeon who's never made a mistake, you'll never get an operation. Vote biblically, then live biblically. 1 Peter 2, Peter said, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. That means, hey, show respect to the position of president and, 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 and to governors, to the law enforcement. For so, first, uh, the next verse, is the will of God. Why do we pray for all of our law enforcement? Because we're told to. Has there ever been a corrupt law enforcement individual? No, I'm sure. I dare say we've had corrupt family members. I dare say you've been corrupt at times, and I have been corrupt. But that doesn't mean that all of them are guilty of doing things they shouldn't. We're to pray for our law enforcement. We're to pray for our military. We're to pray for all of our governing leaders, and we do. If you're here, you know we do that. And that's point number three. Pray biblically. First Timothy 2. What did Paul write? I exhort therefore that first of all. See, here's the thing. If, you, if you're not praying about it, we really have nothing to complain about. Pray. Pray for the election. Pray God gives you wisdom. Pray God helps you to be the citizen you're supposed to be. I believe that Christians are to be the greatest citizens that there are in this country. So Paul, when he told these Christians in Rome, hey, I know they're lighting you up. I know you're hiding. I know you're worshiping underground. I know that some of your family and people you hold dear have been brutally murdered by the Roman government. Can I ask you, keep praying for them. Keep paying your taxes. Tertullian, who is an ancient historian, said, to be quite honest, the reason they didn't kill all the Christians in Rome is that Christians were the only people who paid their taxes. Pay your taxes. I don't like paying taxes. I will vote against paying taxes. But if I need to pay taxes, I'm going to be the first one to pay my taxes. I don't want to pay more than my taxes. But I want to pay my tax. Why? Because I'm a light. I represent God. Because ultimately I know he, he's going to do what he's doing. And ultimately the whole world's going to turn against him. And then where's that going to put me? So I may as well get used to it now. Vote biblically, live biblically, pray biblically. For this is the will of God. So that you may live a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness and in honesty, so that others might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So you're not going to hear me say anything more about it. I'm happy to answer any questions. But can I encourage you, if you are a citizen, get registered to vote and plan to vote so that one day you can say, okay, God, I, I, I took the freedom you gave me, and I, I, I matched it up with you as best as I knew how, and I prayed for your wisdom, and I voted. Great. And then whether it goes your way or it doesn't, you don't have to complain. At least you did something. You didn't just hand over opportunities to reflect God. So if you're a Christian, be the best citizen you can be. Pray, live it out, and go vote. If you don't know Jesus, it's all great, but this is not your eternal hope. Whoever wins in November is not your eternal hope. 
Jesus is your eternal hope. And we would love to talk with you about him. He came to die on a cross for you and me so that we could have life forever. When this world is gone, where we can live in a place where he rules and he reigns. And how many of you know it's all going to be righteousness and holiness all day long? Amen? And if you don't know him, I pray that today you'll say, I want to know him. And let somebody here take a Bible and show you how you can put your trust in him today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed. In a moment, we're going to have just an invitation. Ryan's just going to play. Maybe, maybe holy, holy, holy. He's just going to strum. Today, let me, nobody's going to call your name. Nobody's going to embarrass you. That's not why we're here. But I wonder if there's anybody that would be here that would just say, hey, Pastor, look, that's great. Now, hear what you're saying, and, and maybe I agree or disagree. But the reality is, I don't know that I have a relationship with Jesus. The greatest relationship you can have is with Jesus. And he transcends all the politics, all the kingdoms of this world. He is truth. He is life. And he's the only way to heaven. He can forgive you today and cleanse you of your sin. Is there anybody that would be here to say, you know, Pastor, look, if something happened to me today, I died. I'm not, I'm not even really sure what would happen to me. I don't know that, that I have salvation. So before you pray, Pastor, would you pray for me today? Would you just slip a hand up with nobody looking, and I'll just pray by need. I don't know your name, but I'll pray for your need. Anybody pray for me today, Pastor? You know, um, we'd love to talk with you today. We have men, we have ladies who will sit and open a Bible and answer any and all questions that you have. And I pray if you don't know Jesus today, that today you would say, I want to know him. I want to know how I can have eternal life. And then I know it's a little bit different kind of service today, but maybe God's spoken to you. I've just learned that I don't, I don't work the way God works. So I don't know what God may or may not be doing in your heart, but we're going to take a moment of just kind of silence to pray. And if God's speaking to you, maybe you need to talk with somebody or pray with somebody. I'm going to be right down here at the front, and I want to give you that opportunity. You just come slip on out, come on down, and I'll be glad to pray with you today. Let's all stand for prayer. Can we do that? Lord, I thank you for your word. And I don't know how you're working in people today. Lord, I know that every part of our life has been transformed because of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that you showed us that government is something you created. And so I pray we'll take this information and process it. And Lord, maybe we need to recalibrate a little bit. And then, Lord, we realize, though, that it's a part of our life, but it's not our life. That our lives belong to you. So, Lord, I pray that our hope will be once again directed in you. I pray today, Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as Savior, that today they would say, hey, Jesus, be my Savior. Make that decision in their life, we pray. Lord, bless, we ask. With heads bowed, Ryan's just going to play. Let's just take a moment. If God speaks to you, you just pray there where you stand, where you sit. If you need to slip out, you come. You need to talk to someone, I'm here. We won't tarry long, but respond to God in your life. Lord, thank you that you love us enough to teach us. And I pray that 